Howdy folks, it's Age of the Hunting Gear Guy. Today I wanted to show you guys this Savage 64. This is a semi-automatic 22 LR by Savage. Uh, it's magazine fed and uh, it's kind of interesting. It's, these things have been around forever. They used to be the uh, Lakefield uh, Model 64s and uh, have since been taken over by Savage oh, a, a long while back. Um, so this is, a, this is quite an old design and uh, right now Savage is selling these things here very inexpensively uh, because they're making room for their newer style uh, uh, semi-autos and bolt action 22s. They're actually using a different magazine these days uh, for good reason. Uh, but uh, why don't we go ahead and safety check this thing. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pull the magazine out which is kind of a pain in the butt because you got to use this weird index finger thing. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull the bolt to the rear and I can see that the chamber is empty. So why don't we go on and take a closer look at this thing. Now just starting at the rear of the Savage 64, we've got this curved butt plate here. This is just plastic. It's not super grippy, but I guess it's okay. We've got this molded in checkering, which is pretty rough. That'll, uh, that'll hold all right. Uh, we've got a molded in plastic trigger guard, which you would expect on a, a rimfire this price range. Uh, we've got this toggle safety up at the top, and you can see it there. This one, I think you're actually supposed to use, well, I mean, I guess you could reach over with your thumb there. I always end up just using my index finger because it's handy and my thumb wants to stay over there kind of a thing, but I guess you could break grip to uh, get your thumb up on there. Not an ideal safety spot. I don't really like uh, where this one is and how far you have to reach for it. Um, in general, this is a really long receiver. If you think of uh, how you're pulling the trigger up here and the action is happening up here, this is a, this is a ton of room on this receiver here uh, that's kind of dead space. So um, it's kind of showing its, uh, its age in the design on this thing with, uh, with that style there. Most uh, uh, more modern rim fires will be a little bit more compact in the receiver area here. Um, just while we're on the bottom here, uh, this magazine comes out by pulling the uh, magazine release forward, which is, I think this is the only rimfire rifle I know of that does this. Uh, it's got these uh, magazines that have this cutout towards the front right here, and that's actually what it's latching onto. So it, uh, you kind of have to push that thing out of the way to, uh, to get the magazine in there. Just kind of pin, but if you can, if you can, just use your index finger and push it and uh, pull your magazine out. But not really a, a great way of putting a, a magazine in. I've heard some complaints about these magazines not feeding correctly. This one ran flawlessly, so uh, I have really nothing but good good things to say about the reliability of this rifle. The usability stinks. This magazine is uh, just in a bad location. It's also uh, somewhat dated in its length. Uh, Savage's new uh, box mags that are uh, that are uh, uh, helical or not helical. Savage's new mags are flush mount and fit ten in them, whereas this stick mag style kind of well sticks out. <laughs> So, uh, so there's the magazine. Uh, just getting towards the action here, we've got this uh, this knurled uh, bolt handle here, this charging handle. It's uh, free spinning. Uh, it pulls to the rear. This thing's got a very uh, stiff recoil spring on it. And uh, you can also, there's an indent uh, right here where you can push the bolt back to and then push it in. You just have to get it to the right spot. It's not at really at the re full rear of the action. So if you put it in and then you load up a magazine and pop it forward, uh, I don't know if you guys can see in there, but it's only really half on the ammo. So this won't actually load the rifle. You'll have to stroke it all the way back and then release it in order for it to, uh, to fully load up. So, uh, Kind of interesting. Uh, it, it will not uh, lock to the rear on an empty magazine so our magazine is in there and I can pull it all the way to the rear and it will not lock back on that. So uh, you will uh, click on an empty chamber on this thing and that will be your indication to reload the magazine. Uh, on the bottom here we've got two action screws. Uh, they're actually quite big. They use a, what do I got here, 5 30 seconds uh, Allen key. So that's quite large for, uh, for rimfire. We've got steel plate on the bottom here that's protecting that plastic from getting too augered out. Some uh, rimfire rifles will actually have these screws going directly into the stock plastic whereas this one does not. Uh, on the top we are uh, uh, we have got this dovetail uh, 3 8 groove here if you want to use a rimfire style uh, scope. Um, again, 
many of the more modern design is to go with keeping these uh, these rimfire uh, dovetails in but to also include uh, uh, traditional uh, weaver mounts that you can mount a, a more steady scope to because these things are, are kind of a, a pain in the butt if you use cheap rings that don't grab onto them very well uh, they will slide uh, even with the mild recoil of a 22. Uh, up towards the middle here, we've got a ramped uh, rear sight. So this uses one of these uh, one of these rampy deals, and what you do is you just push push up on the rear sight, and then you can ramp it up so that you can fire for long distance, or you can push it to the forward for your uh, shorter distance. So. Yes, I got that right. Uh, so this is kind of uh, how you adjust for uh, for distance uh, with that rear sight. Uh, we've got a pretty decently long barrel, and then we've got this uh, this front sight in here, which is also dovetailed in. So if that guy is off, you need to get out a brass hammer and hammer it one way or the other. One other thing I just wanted to make a quick note of it. This actually uses the steel sling stud. So this is uh, something of an anomaly because, <laughs> well, especially on a cheap rimfire rifle, you don't usually see steel uh, sling studs at all, or never mind steel, steel sling studs. A lot of them, especially the newer ones, have like these molded in plastic ones that are right in the stock. So actually kind of nice to see these, uh, on a, especially on a rifle this price. Now to disassemble, we're gonna make sure that we're empty. Yes, we're empty. Hey, a lot of people, uh, you don't have accidents where they've uh, thought they had an ri empty rifle and they pull a trigger on it and it goes bang. So we're definitely not going to do that. Let's uh, start pulling. Oh, I need to go the other way. Oh, that's quite loose. Quite loose from the factory. There's our front action screw. That one's pretty loose as well. I wonder if that's factory torque or they just don't torque them down that much. Uh, there goes that... Uh, plate along the bottom there as well. And now we should be able to pull the stock right off of there. There goes our stock. Oh, okay, I'm gonna try taking this thing apart. I don't know about this. Okay, there goes the uh, the middle post. I'm using a one quarter inch drive. Whoa, that one doesn't wanna come. Okay, let's try this rear one here. Oh man, I'm nervous. <laughs> a lot of these old rifles just weren't really meant to be taken apart all that many times. Okay, there goes the rear one. That means there's a big thread on it. Okay, let's get that Phillips head screw out there. Okay, there goes our magwell. Feels like a trigger assembly will go as well. There's a trigger assembly. How the heck do you take this bolt out? Hmm. Uh, maybe it has something to do with this front guy here. Let's see what we can do with it. Holy crap! Oh, man. That front one had a lot of torque on it. I don't see any lock tight so it might have just been really tight on there what happens when that one's released do i get to pull the barrel off <laughs> i get to pull the barrel off come on come on i believe in you ha huh, there we go there's the barrel now i better get to take this bolt out all right Bolt's charging handle comes out, and there comes the bolt. Okay, so you can take the... <laughs> it's not easy. I don't think it's really meant to be taken apart all that many times, but uh, it is possible. Huh. Well, there is our bolt head. Man, I wonder if I should leave this thing disassembled so I can take pictures of it. Hmm. It's not too dirty, but uh, why don't we go ahead and put this thing back together? I bet you there's no videos of that online. So I'm going to start with the bolt back in. I've got the bolt and the uh, recoil assembly here all uh, in one. 
I'm gonna go ahead and pop that guy in. I've got the half moon of the uh, bolt here so that the flat part is facing up. Pop that, oh, I guess it shouldn't pop it that far because I'm gonna need to pull the bolt handle in there, aren't I? There's my bolt handle. I'm gonna just stuck that guy in there and then pop it into this track here. I might actually push it right back and just lock it to the rear just to kind of keep it out of the way so I can push this barrel back in. Looks like the barrel also has the extractor kind of like all in one spot here. Well, that'd be really easy though if you, if you want to clean your barrel, your barrel just comes right off, right? All right, let's go ahead and throw this guy back here. I'm gonna be very careful to get that extractor right into my bolt. There it goes. And I'm gonna back it up so I've got that key kind of uh, hanging out there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pull my, uh, my bolt, or sorry, my barrel key thing, longer leg towards the front. Am I on the right side? I think I am. I believe. Maybe the other way. Maybe not the other way. Maybe it needs to go in a lot further. Oh, there we go. It needs to go in a lot further. There she goes. Now I've got that key visible there. Feels good. Now let's go ahead and throw our front post on here. Is that the one? Let's see, this guy was in there. Yeah, this front post just goes on all by its lonesome. And on you go. I'm gonna torque it pretty tight since that's holding my barrel on. Let's see if I can remember how to put this thing back together properly. Uh, uh, underneath, yeah, sure, why not? Okay, underneath you go. And do I have everything lined up? Why doesn't it want to line up there? Let's see. Probably because it needs to cock the, uh, yeah, it needs to cock it. Okay, so we're gonna need to pop down something easy first. Why don't I grab this front guy and then cock it back just a little bit. That's just pre-cocking the sear a little bit, so I'm holding back on that trigger assembly. Ah, yeah, there goes that Phillips screw in there. And then this small post guy with this star ring here goes in the rear. That one's decently torqued down, but not too, like, strong. And then the rear one. Which is kind of a pain in the butt to get going because of that trigger is in the way. So I'm just going to hand start it. If you have an Allen key, this would be the time to use it. I don't want to bother getting mine out. There is our lower assembly assembled. Looks like it's working. Safety's working. And that's firing. So looks like we're good to go. I'm gonna hold it down. This is something you can use on some of your other guns as well. Pull it all the way to the rear, let go, and then see if your disconnector works. Yeah, disconnector works just fine. And safety works as well. Let's go ahead and put this thing back in the stock. All right, this video is already getting long. Let's get to it here. All right, let's grab that floor plate thingamabobber, base plate, whatever you want to call it. Get in there. Man, why do they make it so tight to these screws? Get in your home. Jeez. Okay. There that guy goes. Let's get that a little bit more in the center. I'm not 
not going to go too tight. Maybe if it was just snug from the factory, that's the way it's supposed to be. Still cycling all right. And my mag feels like it's in the right spot as well. So now that you've had a closer look at this uh, rifle, you've probably seen that, yeah, I mean, the design is, uh, is quite old on it. Uh, reliability on this particular one was excellent. I, I had no fillers to feed through a day of uh, testing all sorts of different ammo from very flat nose stuff that should cause uh, a lot of failures to uh, uh, really dirty ammo. And uh, this action doesn't look particularly dirty. It doesn't look like it's fired like, you know, 500 rounds kind of a thing. So. Uh, pretty reliable uh, uh, little 22. Um, just running these uh, the dovetail mounts here, you can run a scope on this rifle. I found accuracy to be eh, not the best. Uh, so this is uh, this is just one of my targets here that I've got a couple of different uh, groups on. There's M22 at 1.48 inches. This is all shot at 50 yards. Uh, we've got 2.5 inches with a Gila, 1.81 inches with just Winchester bulk stuff, and in this case, 555. Um, the thing that was worrying to me is I saw a lot of like vertical stringing. We've got CCI standard over here, and we've got a 4.78 inch group, very tall and very skinny. Uh, and then this Federal Blue Box also gave me that uh, stringing as well as the SK Match. Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of kind of weirdness with uh, with this rifle. Uh, so I, I did get some okay groups. The SK Standard gave me a 1.34, and American Legal gave me a 1.26 inch group. So not bad with some of them, but again with a lot of different kind of ammo, this rifle did not really like to throw in uh, accurate groups with it. So. Uh, if I was to get, uh, if I was to keep this uh, particular rifle, I don't think I'd run a scope on it. I'd probably just run iron sights uh, because they're good enough, and uh, for you know 50 yards, it's not you know printing cloverleaves reliefs anyways. So you might as well run a. Uh, uh, just iron sights on it. Um, the iron sights have quite a short uh, sight radius. You can see that it's just going from here to here. Since it's a long barrel, it's not too bad. I I just love rifles that have sights that are further towards the back, like your M1 Grands and that kind of thing. You just get that much uh, longer of a sight picture. But these are pretty quick to use. They're just like a, a real plain uh, uh, blade style sight, which I have no problem with. That's what I grew up on is, is just plain blade sights. Uh, I think they'll work just fine. Found reliability excellent. I didn't mind the fact that um, it didn't have a bolt hold open. I did mind these magazines. This is this is terrible. The, the design on these things is just awful. You kind of have to ram it into the mag well to get it to kind of go in there. And if you're not looking right at the stupid thing to, to get it in, and you've just got it kind of pointed down or something like that, it can be kind of hard to, to to get it to get to its home. Now, I mean, you, you're gonna get used to uh, running these things, so it might work for you over the longer term, but weird design, weird design mags. Having the catch like this and have it like kind of a cast into this uh, this mag body is a, is a bit weird. And then it's also got these, you know, uh, holes in there for uh, for dirt and debris to kind of get into. So I'm not, I don't, I can't say I'm a fan of the magazine. I guess is is what I'd really like to say here. Uh, the design of the bolt itself is uh, is a bit dated. Um, everything is very in line with the bolt. In order to pull this bolt out, like again, like you saw with the disassembly, you actually have to pull the barrel off and pull everything out the front, which was. Uh, a bit weird, um, you know, it wasn't quite as hinky as, as some of the other 22s are. Like, again, 22s are, are typically pretty hard to uh, disassemble and don't come with a really easy disassembly. Just, they haven't thought of it or something, I don't know. Uh, the bolt itself is kind of hard to, to get that last bit of the way, so it's not enough to, uh, to pull it back there. You do have to pull it that last bit. Man, it's hard. <laughs> There's a second string in there or something because uh, boy, it's hard to uh, to pull back there. Just pass that last little bit. So I don't know if I could recommend this for a kid rifle because they'd uh, I don't know if they'd be able to get get it past there. And it's just not as easy as some of the other semi-autos out there. Um, but what the one thing that this Savage 64 has going for it is price. These things are incredibly well priced. Uh, this particular one was $160. So. Um, Canadian, um, in Canada here, so very inexpensive uh, rimfire rifle, and uh, there's just not really a lot of competition out there. The Marlin 7095s are out there, um, but then when you look into like Mossberg's got the Blaze, but boy, you want to talk about a cheap design on a, on a rifle, that thing's got like a clamshell plastic stock on it, so um, 
In terms of the cheap rifles though, in terms of a, a cheap semi-auto 22, I wouldn't buy this one. Oh, well, I did, but <laughs> I wouldn't buy it again. I would buy a, uh, a Marlin 795. They're more accurate. Uh, the trigger's better. This one's got like almost like a two-stage trigger. You see that pre-take up there? Uh, very long trigger. Uh, the trigger's not bad after that, but uh, it's, uh, it's very long. Oh, it's kind of heavy actually too. Let's do that again. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> uh, but again, Savage has already moved, moved on to a new design on, uh, on a lot of their 22s, so they're, uh, they're gonna move past these. So um, if you wanna get like a, an inexpensive, kind of a knock around uh, 22, uh, they'll be blowing these things out uh, and uh, selling them for less than, uh, uh, than they have in the past. So if you wanted your chance to get ha your hands on an inexpensive 22, at least this one was, was very reliable. Uh, you might want to check out this Savage 64. Thanks for watching.